Welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church Online. My name is Marian Brown, one of the associate pastors, and this is our on-demand version of the sermon that will be preached on this Sunday morning. And please know that our Sunday services will be live streamed beginning at 9 a.m. for the contemporary service and 11.15 for the traditional service. If you would like to have the entire worship experience on demand, that will be available on Monday morning. We appreciate you being a part of our online community and we invite you to be active and participate through your giving. And so we thank you for your support and your generosity. Before we listen to this Sunday sermon, let's have a moment of prayer. Gracious and holy Lord, we ask that you remind us that wherever we are, we are on holy ground. And so may you help us make space. So may we receive a message that you have for us in this moment. Be in our hearts so that it's open. Be in our ears so that they are open and be a part of our lives so that we are open to receive a challenge and an invitation. Work within us now and all around us so that we may know your presence and we may feel it fully. Through a moment now of words and scripture, speak to us, amen. Let's listen to this Sunday sermon. This morning I'll be reading from Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 23. And this is what it says. Now when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, and others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. And he said to them, but who do you yourselves say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Then he gave the disciples strict orders that they were to tell no one that he was the Christ. From that time, Jesus began to point out to his disciples that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and to suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and scribes, and to be killed, and to be raised upon the third day, and yet... Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are, not stum you are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's purposes, but on men's. Pray with me. Jesus, this day, give us the those eyes to see and those ears to hear your purposes. We've spent way too much time this week trying to make sure the world knows our purposes and we ask for forgiveness. And this day, open our hearts to your purpose, to your will. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. A while back, Tony Campolo told a story about the Oklahoma State football team. The quarterback was Randy Johnson. And the team had had a pretty mediocre year. And as Tony Campolo said, Randy Johnson was a pretty mediocre quarterback. It was the last game of the season and they didn't have a winning season that year. But all could be salvaged if they beat their rivals, the University of Oklahoma. It was the last game of the season. It was the fourth quarter. There was only a minute left on the clock and they were down by six points. They had the full length of the field to go. It was fourth down. They only had time for one more play. 
So the coach, knowing that this was going to be the last play for all of the seniors, he put the seniors on the field. They got together in the huddle, and the quarterback, Randy Johnson, called play number 13, which was unusual because they'd never run play number 13 in a game before. They tried it a few times in practice, and it had never worked in practice, so they never tried it in a game. It was a trick play. Well, it turned out that it worked. That, it, that one play, they ran all the way down the field, scored a touchdown, kicked a field goal, and won in the final seconds of the game. Well, the crowd was elated. The, the season had been salvaged because Oklahoma State had beaten University of Oklahoma. People rushed onto the field, and the, and the coach rushed over to Randy Johnson and said, Randy, that was incredible. What made you call play number 13? And Randy said, there we were in the huddle. It was nothing but the seniors. And I looked over at Harry, big number seven. And Harry had tears coming down his, his face. And I could see this was going to be his last game. And I looked next to him, and there was Ralph, big number eight. And I, I saw the two numbers on their jerseys, and I added eight and seven together. And I came up with 13 and called play number 13. That's when the coach said, well... <laughs> Randy, you do know that 8 and 7 don't add up to 13. And Randy thought for a moment, he goes, Yeah, coach, and if I was as smart as you, we'd have lost the game. <laughs> well, I like that story a lot. But it shows something that's very true. Sometimes the correct answer isn't always the right answer. The correct answer isn't always the right answer. And that's exactly what's going on with Peter right here. He gives the correct answer. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He says what, what, what all have been waiting to hear, that Jesus is the Christ. It is the correct answer. Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Son of the living God. He has the right knowledge. But what Jesus desires is the answer that comes through faith. A faith that trusts not in right knowledge, but trusts, trusts in the right relationship with God, to know God's purposes. Jesus came so that we would know God's purposes and do them. To know God's purposes and to, to do them. To know the will of God and to do it, it wouldn't remain a mystery. It's why Jesus came. A lot of folks have the right answers, excuse me, the correct answers, but not the right ones. We can stand in the right place on certain issues, and, but not know the, the right answers. Jesus, Jesus Jesus is at the heart of God's purpose. Jesus came to save us from sin. And that's the first thing that I want to talk about this morning. Jesus came to save us from sin. When, before Jesus was born, when the, the angel Gabriel came to Mary and Joseph, the angel said, you shall call him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And that's what the name Jesus means. God saves. The angel didn't just pull it up himself. He wanted to make sure in the very beginning of the book of Matthew that the reader from that point on knows why Jesus came, to save us from our sins. But sometimes we get confused because of the way we use that word save. A lot of times if you think bank and you think save, that we're, we're saved, we're put aside for heaven later on. That to save something is to make sure that it's not damaged or hurt and it's put aside for, for later on. Well, instead of thinking bank, think lifeguard. That when a person is drowning, it's the lifeguard who does what the person can't do for themselves. The lifeguard swims out and saves them and brings them to shore. It's the lifeguard who goes and makes sure that they have life. The lifeguard goes where 
others can't or others won't, and certainly the person who's drowning can't do on their own. And that's what Jesus did for you and for me on the cross. He did what we couldn't do for ourselves, that he took on himself all the sin. Now, there's another word that sometimes we, we only mention it in religious circles and we think it's equal to just doing something wrong. Usually, we, we try and relegate it to, you know, lie, cheat, steal, cuss, smoke, robbing banks, those kind of kinds of things. And it's, usually, it's for somebody else. It's certainly not for us. But sin is anything that separates us from God. John Wesley, the one who started the Methodist movement in the 1700s, asked his mother, godly and very holy woman, what, what is sin? And this is what Susanna Wesley said. She said, whatever weakens your reasoning, impairs your tenderness of your conscience, obscures your sense of God, takes off your relish for spiritual things. Whatever increases the authority of the body over the mind, that thing is sin to you, however innocent it may seem in itself. It's whatever weakens, whatever impairs, whatever obscures. For Adam and Eve, it was an apple. Seems very innocent. But God gave that, that word of grace to Adam and Eve. The word of grace was don't. But through pride, Adam and Eve said, well, we know more than God. It's, the Bible tells us they, they, they saw that it was good for food, that it was a pleasure to the eyes. And it's the pride that says we know more than God. Pride that says others can can go here and it might hurt them, but it's okay for us. That we can dabble in those things that, that weaken. We can dabble in those things that impair. We can dabble in those things that obscure the sense of God around us. That it's okay for us, but it, it's not okay for someone else. Jesus took on himself all those things that would destroy us. All those things that would weaken, impair and obscure. He took those things on himself and he nailed it to the cross. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, Christ had no sin, but God made him to become sin so that in Christ we could become right with God. He took all the things that would destroy us and he nailed them to the cross. And when he rose from the grave on the third day, he rose to give us power over those things. Not one day, not to be saved for heaven, but saved in the here and now where his power would live through you and me and give us power over whatever it is that separates us from God. Not one day, but this day. To know his will and to have power enough to do it. To know his will and to have power enough to do it. That's the purpose of God. Through Jesus Christ, he came to save us from our sin. Second thing that I want to talk about this morning is God's purpose that Jesus came to save us from our sin, but also Jesus came to, to reconcile us, to reconcile us to God. We know that Jesus was born in, in Bethlehem and he was raised in Nazareth of Galilee. But we also know that he didn't stay in Nazareth of Galilee. He traveled far, far from home. He didn't wait for people to come to him. That Bartimaeus, he was blind, and Jesus healed him beside the road. Zacchaeus, he was a tax collector that Jesus fetched from up a tree and forgave his sin. The ten lepers, they were out in the countryside when Jesus healed them. As a matter of fact, Jesus tells story after story after story about God who seeks and searches and finds. He tells a story about 
a shepherd who had a hundred sheep and one of them went missing and he didn't say, well, I'll show up one day. No, he went out to find the one that was missing and when he found him, he put him on his shoulders and in returning, all those rejoiced with him. It was a time for joy. It was a time for celebration. It was a time for coming together and reconciling that sheep back to the fold. He told a story about a woman who had 10 coins. She didn't say, well, nine's almost as good as 10. I'm sure it'll show up sometime. I put it somewhere. No, that wouldn't do. This woman pulled out a lamp. She pulled out a broom. She began to search. She began to sweep until she found the one coin that was lost. And she called her neighbors to celebrate, to share joy that the one that was lost was now found. It was reconciled. It was back where it belonged. Jesus told a story about a son who took his inheritance, not after his father died, but before his father died. It says that he, that son went to a distant country and squandered his estate on loose living. Now the father didn't say, well, good riddance. It's good to have you out of the house. There's not gonna be so much turmoil around here. No tells us that this father kept his eyes on the horizon. And Jesus tells us that, that while the son was still a long way off, that the father ran, that the father ran and embraced and kissed him. And when he brought him back to the home, the place, to home where he belonged, he called for rejoicing, music, and put steaks on the grill, that it was time for joy, it was time for celebration. That the place that God has for you and for me is a place of joy, it's a place of peace, it's a place of reconciliation. And that that's how God has, has made you and me to be a part of his reconciliation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and 18 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, this person is a new creation. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That this world, this world longs to know what it is to be a part of what God is doing here, a part of his purpose, a part of the reason that, that we were made. And people won't know that they matter to God until they know that they matter to us. And together we're called as, as God's people, God's church is what God's people are called, to reach out into a world so people will know that they matter to God so that they, they matter to us. Every month, we feed, right here on this campus, a thousand meals, groceries, and home goods. And so far this year, over 700 pounds of, of produce from our giving garden to families who have children in the free lunch program. So they'll know they matter to God, so they matter to us. We reach out to children who speak English as a second language to help tutor them in school so they'll know they matter to God, so they matter to us. Last, last week, we prepared 15,000 meals to go to people in the Philippines so they would know because they matter to God, they matter to us. Each week, there are 30 support groups that hear meet here on this campus. People struggling with recovery, struggling with brokenness, struggling with loss. And we provide a place for them so they'll know that they matter to God, so they matter to us. We have 35 mission partners here and around the world. People right here who are homeless. That we try and move them from homelessness into a home, help prepare them on what it is to make a budget, what it is to, to be reconciled, to know that they matter to God so they matter to us. 
We reach around the world to places like Jordan to let people who are refugees from the war know that they matter to God so they matter to us. Places like Egypt to teach and educate young girls where it's hard for a young girl to get an education. We reach out in ways like divine providence in Kenya to train pastors and to provide clean water so they can reach out beyond, farther than any of us could on our own to train those pastors to go all over the country to let people know that they matter to God so that they matter to us. That is our ministry, a ministry of reconciliation. It's the ministry, that you, the purpose of God that we've been given. The purpose of God to let people know that, the, that Jesus came to save them, to rescue them from sin. Not just for the hereafter, but in the here and now and the hereafter. Last year, 93 young people made a first-time commitment to Jesus Christ here in this church. Last week, we baptized 11 people. Three were adults. The others were sixth graders. We confirmed 37 people here in this church to let them know that they matter to God, they matter to us, and that Jesus Christ is available to live his life through, through them, through us together. That his spirit joins our spirit together. And so I want to invite you to be a part of what God's doing in the world, to get in the game, to get off the sofa, to put our little with God's much, and to give, and to give freely. This is our Giving Sunday, and I'm inviting you to pledge so we'll know how we can reach out to a world that matters to God so they matter to us. And for 2024, how, how we can, you can pledge for that is there on your screen. It says rumc.com backslash pledge. You can pledge for the coming year. We can put our little with God's much. And together we can make a difference in the world. Pray with me. Jesus, we have an opportunity not just to sit back and, and know correct answers. But by faith to do your will. Draw our spirits with your spirit that we reach out beyond ourselves and we point to you, you who saves us from sin, Jesus, to you who reconciles us. Help us, help us to let this world know that they, they matter to you so they matter to us. Help us as we put our little with your much. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us online. It is a blessing to have the gift of technology to have sermon this way. We thank you for participating. And just a reminder, if you wanna see the live services, 9 a.m. on Sunday for contemporary and 11.15 Sunday morning for traditional services. And always we will have the full on-demand worship experience on Monday morning. And if there's ever a time that you would like to join us here at the physical location, we're located at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, Roswell, Georgia. We want to be connected with you. If you have a prayer request, please let us know by emailing pray at rumc.com. And we would love for you to be a part of our ministry through your giving. If you would like to support our campus and our ministries, you can do so at rumc.com slash give. And now hear these words of a benediction. Love without fear, serve with commitment. And in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go in peace. Amen.